Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Library Creative Games webinar. My name is George Bergstrom, and I'm the Southwest Regional Coordinator from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. Uh, I'll be the host and question moderator today. Our presenter this afternoon is Allison Shepard. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few quick announcements. To register for other webinars available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov library. For a full list of our current in-person training menu, please see our continuing education website. The Indiana State Library has many ways to try to stay connected to library staff across the state. For weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word. We also offer a blog which provides information about the Indiana State Collection, interviews spotlights on the staff from across the state, and information about upcoming events at the Indiana State Library. If you have questions in today's webinar, just go ahead and type them in the chat box on the upper left-hand side of the screen. I'll be watching and I will get the questions to Allison as soon as there is a good opportunity. There should also be time near the end for questions. This session is one hour, so you'll get one LEU for today. I will be sending those out sometime in the next few weeks, along with a link to this webinar in case you want to refer to it in the future. If at any point during the webinar you experience any sound issues, please see the sound issues box just below the chat box on the left side of the screen. If there is a global sound issue, we will announce it in the chat pod. And if you're unable, if we are unable to resolve the sound issues you're experiencing, uh, we are recording the meeting and you can watch it offline after the meeting has ended. Again, if there's a global sound issue, we will make the announcement in the chat box. So without further ado, I'll now turn the presentation over to Allison Shepard. And thank you all for being here. I just want to make sure that you can all hear me okay to start off. Just type in the chat if you can hear me. Uh, if you can't, I guess you won't know to type. Perfect. Um, if my sound does anything weird, just let me know in the chat. I'll also try to keep an eye on that as well. Uh, but today I'll be talking to you about library created games or games developed by libraries. Uh, I'm showcasing some games that I've been working on developing for my library, but also games developed by other libraries, including academic uh, and public libraries. So games can be used in a lot of different contexts and to teach a lot of different skills. But before I jump in, I'm going to introduce myself. Um, so my name is Allison Shepard. I'm an assistant professor and online learning librarian at the University of Tennessee Knoxville Libraries. I've worked here since early 2017, uh, and I also like to call myself our unofficial gaming librarian. Um, you can reach me at allison at utk.edu if you have questions after this. I'll also have a slide at the end that includes my email address and some more contact information as well. And before I jump into presenting the games themselves, if you want to follow along, I've made a QR code for the public version of the presentation here. You can also get to the presentation by going to this tiny URL as well. And I'll leave this up for just a moment while I talk about why I've been researching this. Um, so this is a research project I started earlier this year, late last year. Uh, I've been collecting information about game collections, gaming events and libraries, and library game development. Most of the games that I'm talking about today I learned about through conference presentations, searching library websites, reading research articles about games created by libraries, and also books published on the topic. I'm excited about this topic because I'm a massive gaming nerd both in my job and outside of work. At work, I've been involved with developing library games, running gaming events like International Games Week, which is coming up in November. Uh, and my library also has a monthly game night where we offer board games, video games, virtual reality, and more recently, we've added role-playing sessions like Dungeons and & Dragons and some other RPGs. Outside of work, I also play a ton of board games, video games, uh, and I have a regular D&D group that meets. So one thing I've learned throughout this process before I start sharing the games uh, is that a lot of libraries are involved with developing games or running gaming events. 
However, it's kind of hard to find information on these. Um, some of them are hosted online and they have a Creative Commons license so you can download them and use them for yourself. But there's not really one online source that collects all of the games created by libraries that I found that was really covering the whole spectrum. I do think that would be a great resource that we could see in the future. I'm going to move on from this slide, but if you need the link again later, it is in the chat and I can share it at the end as well. So the first type of game I'm going to talk about is board games, which are great as standalone games or for testing game mechanics before you move into a digital format. Uh, that's because they really let you test out what kind of mechanisms you're setting up before you move to digital, which is more time consuming and more difficult. Board games can take a significant amount of time to develop the final version. You usually create multiple iterations, do beta testing in between, and make changes as needed. But the good thing about board games is you can make a draft really quickly. All you need is some paper, something to write with, and some game pieces that you can also create out of paper as well. Um, I've been involved with two and a half board game projects so far. The two that I've been involved with, we currently use for internal training and for library instruction at the library. The half that I'm not going to be showing you today was a grant proposal that I submitted shortly after I started at the University of Tennessee. Uh, I've got a background information on it. Uh, I sketched out what the board would look like and the general idea for the rules, but the grant wasn't accepted, so that's kind of sitting aside for the moment until I can return to that project. So the first game I'm going to talk about a little bit is called Acquisitions Adventure. It was developed here at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, I was involved with this process, but I worked on this with my coworker, Victoria Ogle, who works in our acquisitions department. This is a game for training people about the acquisitions process, and we currently use it to train new acquisitions department staff so they know how the process works. Uh, but it's also used to teach library liaisons and other librarians in different departments how the process works. Before I started working on this, I had no idea how the acquisitions process worked at UT. I had done a little bit of ordering things through Gobi at my previous job, but the process here is really complex. Uh, and there are a lot of different things that can go wrong throughout the process. So it's important for people to understand what's happening throughout the process so they know why things take longer than they expect. Here's a screenshot of the board itself. Um, so this is the current iteration that we have. We may in the future make some changes to it, but this is the version that we've tested quite a few times uh, with library staff and come to this version. So players start at the top left on the green space that says start. On each of their turns, they move forward one space. Uh, at the start of the game, they get an envelope with an item that they're trying to order. So as they move through the board, they're going through the process for how you would purchase that item. They start out by going to the area or fund that the item would be sent to. Uh, they find out if it's something that already exists in our collection, and if it does, they start over. They determine what vendor they need to submit the request to, uh, whether the vendors in our system list or if they have to put in a new vendor request. They have to check master agreements, licensing. Uh, eventually, they get to the ordering process and have to make sure they get licensing approval. And then you'll notice down here at the very end of the board, uh, before you get to finish, there's actually a loop after place order with vendor request invoice. Um, people can get stuck in this loop of whether the invoice was received or not, uh, because sometimes it does take a significant amount of time for items to arrive, whether we order a physical item or a digital item. So I think this game does a good job of showing all of the different people who have to touch an order before we get it. Uh, there are a lot of steps and a lot of chances for the process to be halted or started over, depending on what's requested. One thing I really wanted to highlight from this board game, my coworker Victoria Ogle created all of the illustrations for the board. Uh, we gave the library a fantasy theme, so all of the characters that we created for that followed that theme. She actually drew all of these characters herself, and I just really wanted to highlight this. Here are some of the cards from this game that I wanted to point out as well. So the first is an order card, and it's a rush order for a book requested by a researcher. So that would go to the rush category. 
uh, and then a list of a vendor. Some of the vendors we used were actual vendors that you could order from, but some of them we made up since it's a fantasy library. And here are some of the cards for licensing approval or payment options approved. Uh, for some of them, the options were just yes or no. Uh, but for some of the options, we wanted to give a humorous spin as well. So for payment option approved, some of the options you see will be, no, this vendor will no longer accept firstborn children as an alternative form of payment. Or no, this vendor only accepts the blood and bone of an Englishman and ours are protected by HIPAA. So that was Acquisitions Adventure. Uh, I'm now moving to a different library that's created a game. This is the Game of Research from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Uh, this game is actually available through a Creative Commons license. So if you want to download that, you can. And there is a link in the speaker notes on the presentation if you want to get access to that. This game very much functions like the game of life. Students are asked, are asked to describe four steps in the research process after they complete playing this game. Uh, goals are being able to identify positive and negative behaviors within the research process and being able to reflect on their own research behaviors as well. So to play the game, you need the board. There are also topic cards that students respond to while playing. They have student worksheets for scoring and keeping track of funds because you do accumulate funds just like in the game of life. And there are dice and uh, little characters that you move around the board as well. So. It works for four to five players. Playtime is about 15 to 20 minutes. Students roll the dice moving around the board. They check off the spaces they land on on their worksheet, and then they collect or pay any money listed on the spaces as well. When they hit a blue topic space, it's got the little dollar signs on it, they receive the amount listed on the topic card that they choose at the beginning of the game. At the end, depending on the level of funds they have, in game, they receive a scholarship or extra credit for the research project that their character would be working on. Again, if you want to check out this game, the link will be in the speaker notes on the presentation. It's really cool. I've not actually had a chance to play it yet, but it looks really interesting. The next game is Information Pursuit, created by Arizona State University. This game was actually created way back in 2005, and I pulled the images that I found from their LOEX presentation from 2007. Uh, so they used it in library instruction classes back more than 10 years ago. It's not entirely clear to me if they're still using it as part of their programming, uh, because I wasn't able to find that information on their website. But it's still a really good example of a different way to approach setting up a board. So this game has a board, it has question cards that you answer when you land on the question mark spaces. There's a Wheel of Fate spinner, which is on the left side of the screen here. You have a die that you use and also pawns that move around the board. The way this game works is students roll to move. They answer multiple choice questions when they land on the question mark squares. And if they answer correctly, they get to continue their turn by moving again. If they answer something incorrectly, they have to stay on the space that they're on until their next turn, and they have to answer a question correctly before they're allowed to move again. There are also bookworm hole spaces, which are the little purple swirly spaces. Uh, those allow players to jump forward on the board. And the dice that they used for this game was actually custom made. So when you roll one, it actually has a symbol for the Wheel of Fate. When you roll that, you get to spin the Wheel of Fate, and then you either get to move forward, move backward, or lose a turn. So it adds a little bit of chaos to the game. Uh, players win by being the first one to get to the end of the board at the very bottom where it says winner on the purple space. Uh, and they also designed this to kind of look like a library building, which was a theme that I also used in the game that I worked on. Speaking of games I've worked on, Pendergrass Clue is another game that I've been involved with creating for the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. This was developed by Holly Dean, Isabella Baxter, Zoe Bastone, and myself. And this is an alternative to a breakout game that we use for one of our branch libraries. So a little bit of history of that. We have had a breakout game in the libraries for quite a while now, uh, which gets students active and moving around library spaces in our main branch library. But Pendergrass Agriculture Library is a smaller space, and we found when we tried to play a breakout game there, it was very disruptive to students using the space. Also, because the space is so small, there aren't that many places for students to visit, so that format doesn't work very well for the space. 
Here's an image of the board. Uh, so it is based on the Clue game. Uh, we modeled it after the library space at Pendergrass with a few changes. Uh, actually, over on the right side where it's showing the people, weapons, and then library fact cards, uh, that's where the stacks are located at Pendergrass Library. There are also more study room spaces there, but having more spaces made the game take longer and was more complicated, so we did simplify that quite a bit. Um, this board was actually created using a combination of watercolor painting and then digital editing. So all of the backgrounds, uh, the little character and weapon icons are watercolor. Everything else was created digitally. So it works exactly like Clue. Players start with colored pawns on the spaces around the board. Uh, they have the names of the characters over here that are all agriculture themed. And they roll a dice to move enter rooms and make a suggestion on who killed Dr. Ag and with what weapon in which space. Uh, we actually have 3D printed weapons that we printed at Pendergrass Library for the weapon pieces that we move around the board as well. Uh, one major change that we made to this game though was the addition of library fact cards. And we require players to draw a library fact card at the start of their turn, read the library fact card aloud, uh, some of them are just facts about the space or the resources they have, and some of them actually have short activities for them to complete. And then they discard them and then complete their turn. Uh, this board also has some secret passages in the corners, so you can get some shortcuts around the library. Um, but this was just a fun way for us to try to introduce students to the library space without actually having them run around and be disruptive. Um, some of the library fact cards as well do include bonuses that allow you to view cards from other players or to be able to move again or move extra spaces. So that we find that does encourage students to actually do the library fact card portion of this game, whereas otherwise they might skip over it. Here's some close-ups of the character and weapon cards. These were all illustrated by Holly Dean, uh, all in watercolor paints. Uh, I just wanted to point these out. I think they turned out really cool. Um, what we've been doing with this game so far is we've been testing it in Animal Science 100 courses this semester. So we've been testing the game for nearly a year now and getting progressive feedback from library faculty and staff. We had some student groups play over the summer and we had people play at another conference as well. Um, this semester we're using it in Animal Science 100 classes and getting student feedback. We're going to take that feedback and create a final version to get professionally printed in the spring semester. So we should have an actual board that folds up a box and everything. The next game format I'm going to talk about is card games. Uh, these can be really great for library and information literacy games because they're portable, they're very easy to set up, and creating them is a really easy process as well. When I'm thinking about building a card game, I usually just use index cards to make the draft. So let's get into some card games that are created by libraries. The first is called Keywords to Mastery, uh, created by the University of Florida. This game helps students gain keyword and natural language processing skills for database searching. So the game has assignment cards that students respond to, and then it has keyword cards that the students draw and use to respond. Players get five keyword cards, and they take turns drawing an assignment card, placing it so everyone can see or reading it aloud, and then people choose the keyword that best fits the assignment. So it's, it's very similar to some card games that already exist. Uh, players then vote on which of these game or which of the responses was the best fit for the assignment, and that player gets a point. So play last 12 rounds. The player who has the most points or gets the most relevant cards responded to the assignments is the winner of the game. Uh, so it's a game that can be played very quickly in classes, and it also offers options for discussions about keywords. Some of the keywords may not match up with some of the assignments, and some of them may be very closely related. So sometimes students have good conversations about which one would be the better option to choose. This game is also available through a Creative Commons uh, license as well. And I have included a link to it in the notes for this slide as well. The next card game is Seek from the University of Huddersfield. Uh, so this is located in the UK. So this game teaches developing search strategies and it asks students research questions 
to try to get them to retrieve useful results. So it's kind of similar to the previous game. It doesn't provide the search terms for you for a lot of these, but it does ask you to consider what terms would work for something. So I've got a few examples up here on the board. Uh, the first is name two broader terms for television. Um, and then it does have some recommendations at the bottom for the person reading the card aloud. So people can make recommendations that are not these answers, but these are the answers that they are recommending could be answered. Um, the middle one is what are the most relevant terms in this research question? Discuss the potential and actual impacts of alcohol on student well-being. Uh, I do see a question in here. Many terms are in British English. Yes, they do have this so you can download it and you can actually edit the file if you want to make sure that it's in American English instead. Um, for I also saw a question as well here too for how do you get these games professionally printed. There are a number of different services online that you can submit your files to and get a professional version printed. And I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more at the end as well. Um, the last example card I have up here is you're starting a new module. Where's the first place you get guidance on what to read? Um, so it gives them a few different options for places they should look first. Um, so it's really teaching students how to approach the research process and being thoughtful about the subject terms that they're using. And also like how do you answer research questions? This one you can also download and make edits to and print your own version. Uh, it's a really great game to play. Sources is another card game also created at the University of Huddersfield. This game actually has two decks of cards. So there's a resource deck and an assignment deck. And like the first game I talked about, you do have assignments that you're kind of responding to. Um, but you'll notice the assignment cards on the left have points located in the top right of the card. Um, the goal of this game is to have the most points at the end of the game. So each player is dealt two assignment cards and four resource cards. Uh, the person who most recently borrowed a book from the library goes first, and then play progresses. Uh, on each turn, players can swap assignment cards or draw a card from the resource stack. After drawing, they can put a set down in front of them to earn the points indicated on the assignment card and draw a replacement assignment card until none more are left. Then they continue playing and they add the resources down for the assignment card to score. Uh, some of the resource cards are things like blogs, which you'll see is represented by the little blue uh, speech bubble. And that's also represented on multiple of the assignments. So you'll see both of the ones on the left include that symbol. You do need the blog or the number of sources listed at the bottom, it has to include the symbols at the bottom to be able to score those points. Some of the cards are also have bonuses included as well. So I've got a library and bonus card here. If you play this card with a book or academic journal card, you triple its value. So it's very much a strategizing game in terms of collecting the sources that you need and choosing assignments that you think will be easy to complete, but also getting the most points. Um, it's a really interesting game and you do add up the scores at the end, so it's kind of hard to tell while you're playing who's going to win. But it does get students to think about, for an essay, these are the kind of sources that I should look at. Or even sources that they wouldn't maybe typically think of, like talking to a librarian. I hope they think of that. But maybe when they're so into the research process, they're just looking for sources themselves and don't realize that getting outside help would be useful. So it's a good way to introduce students to different resources. All of the resource cards have a short description on what the resource is, um, and it's a great way to introduce students to what kind of sources they should be looking for. This one is also a Creative Commons license. You can download the cards and make edits as well, and then print these out to play. The next type of game I'm going to call, talk about is trivia, and trivia is very popular with libraries, and for good reason. It's a game that's really easy to set up and also to play. It can bring out competitiveness in your players, and you can motivate players by including prizes for the most points or correct answers. You can use this in classes, you can use it as part of standalone events, or you can use it for individual play. You can also create trivia in multiple different formats as well, and I'm going to show you just a few examples. So this first example is from my library. I wasn't actually involved with developing this but I was able to attend as a participant. So this is UT Libraries trivia from the 30th anniversary of the expansion of Hodges Library celebration. 
it was in October 2017 that they put out this interactive display on one of our floors next to the checkout desk. So questions would come up with history about the library and history about the University of Tennessee in general. Uh, it was all created in PowerPoint and would play automatically. You could back up if you needed to. But the prizes that we gave out were candy and sticky notes for correct answers. So it's a nice way to interact with students as they're walking by. Uh, it's also like very informal to set up. It, it's just a PowerPoint with the questions and then the answers on the slides afterward. Uh, so not a very high effort game in terms of how much time it takes to create, but it can be really effective at pulling people in and engaging them. The next library I'm going to talk about that does trivia is Milwaukee Public Library, and I actually attended one of their sessions at the Games and Libraries Conference earlier this year. Um, so this is a screenshot from one of the trivia programs that they did, uh, I believe in 2017. It may have been earlier this year for this one. Um, so they did a May the 4th Be With You Family Star Wars trivia session. Uh, they do hold trivia on different topics for all ages. And they also have prizes that are suitable for the trivia topic that they're using as well. Uh, something cool that they do is they also create custom trophies by using 3D printing to give to the winners of trivia too. And I think that's a thing they've started more recently. I didn't pull in a screenshot from that, uh, but they did have some good examples. So they did a Walking Dead trivia and they had a zombie trophy that they printed out painted gold. Um, so this is another way to engage with your patrons. Um, they gave a great presentation about this that I unfortunately wasn't able to attend, but definitely check this out. And you can find a lot of information about their trivia on their website. The next type of game I'm going to talk about is Murder Mysteries. Uh, like trivia, Murder Mystery games are very popular events hosted at libraries. They're usually run by library staff or friends of the library, which play characters that attendees try to identify which character committed a fictional murder. Um, murder mysteries do take more planning than trivia. They can range from very simple setups to very elaborate, which includes costumes, character role playing, props, or decorations. So the first example is also from my library. We've done murder mystery events as part of a library takeout programming initiative uh, here for the last few years. So basically we reach out to residence halls and get groups of students to come from the residence halls to participate in this event. Usually our murder mysteries are themed around something library related. So for the one that I've got screenshots, it was death by monograph. Um, there were two people fighting over whether someone plagiarized a paper or not. And the person who was arguing that someone had was murdered as part of the event. And one of our librarians who was great at acting played that out for us. Uh, but students gathered in this space in the library as groups. They had worksheets to work through, trying to locate clues. The clue board that I have displayed in the bottom right of the screen actually has the clues that they located around the space. So they did move around the room to find the clues. Uh, they were able to discuss the clues, talk to the different characters, and see what their motivations might have been, and then come together at the end to discuss it and make a decision on who they thought was the murderer. They were actually able to guess this one correctly, and they had a ton of fun as well. So I found a lot of libraries with murder mystery events. Uh, here's just a list of a few, but there is a really, really long list online uh, of how many libraries use them. They can be used for engagement, but a lot of public libraries also use murder mystery events to educate patrons about resources. And some also accompany dinner to raise funding for library initiatives. So they exist at both university and public libraries. This is definitely not a comprehensive list. A lot of libraries are doing murder mystery events. The next type of game I'm going to talk about a little bit is also very popular. It's a breakout games. So these can also be played as part of instruction sessions or as standalone events. They can also range from relatively simple to very complex. It just depends on how much time you have to set it up. And also you want to be sure that you're keeping what you create sustainable in terms of setup if it's something that you're repeating. So the first example is from my library again. 
Uh, we have a first year studies breakout game that we run as part of first year studies classes uh, for students to come to the library to learn about our locations, but also how to find online resources as well. Uh, from this, I've pulled our most recent version, some screenshots from that. Uh, the first image is a image of our service locations that we actually have students visit as part of the breakout game. So they visit a lot of our service desks around the second floor, and they also pay a visit to special collections. The smoky symbol that's on the bottom right is what we actually have printed out at a sign uh, at the location that has some information about what kind of services it offers. Um, and also we give students a cut out of this kind of like a flat Stanley thing that they can take with them. They can take photos with it and then tag us on social media so we can share that out as well. In previous years, we had different themes for this breakout game. So in 2017, it had a zombie apocalypse theme. Uh, students also moved around the library and used online resources, and they had physical boxes to unlock as the last clue. After we had been running that version for a little while, we noticed that it was taking a significant amount of time for us to set up. So we've shifted to something that takes a little bit less time to set up, is still engaging for students, and we've also changed the theme because we noticed that the zombie theme is maybe getting a little bit played out. Uh, we wanted to make something that fit in more with the libraries and the university as a whole. So our current program is called Smokey's Library Snapshot. Smokey is the name of the dog that's on the screen, UT's mascot. Um, so this is what we use for our current program. Students do search for books and articles on the library's discovery tool. They also get practice using our chat. And they visit service locations as part of the experience as well. This is another breakout game that we've held at UT Libraries as well. This one was from 2018. Uh, we had a common read, uh, which is a book that all incoming freshmen read and have discussion groups about in 2018 for Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. Um, so students were required to read this book when starting at the University of Tennessee. And one of our librarians, Ingrid Ruffin, reached out to a company in Knoxville called Breakout Knoxville to set up this breakout room. And it actually is a breakout room in every sense, exactly like you would go play at one of these companies. They created a room, they built this room inside of one of our library rooms. It includes furniture, wood paneled walls, hidden clues, and a screen that shows students how much time they have left to escape, but also allows us to give the students clues from behind the wall. Like traditional escape games at Breakout Knoxville, students are successful when they uncover all the clues and find the key code to unlock the door before time runs out. The setup for this was really cool with the room built inside the room. We had librarians monitoring the room with cameras that were set up inside the walls. and We were giving hints through the timer screen as well. The clues that the students found were also closely related to the book Station Eleven, including that you might be able to see in the middle image a custom printed newspaper that we created following the theme of the book. Um, it also included a common phrase used by the main character, survival is inefficient. We had really large groups of students come sign up for this uh, and run through the activity with us. They had a great time and it was nice to pull it into something that they were already doing, so the common read, so they had something to relate to the game and it helped them in finding their clues as well if they had read it. The next type of game I'm going to talk about is very different. Um, so online games for libraries are one of the more time consuming formats that you can create. Their strengths are that they can be played anywhere, anytime, and can be played by individuals or groups. Some games are built by tools like Adobe Captivate or Articulate Storyline. Some of them are flash based or used other programs as well. Um, there are also some open access programs that you can use to create games as well, and I'm happy to talk about some of those after we get finished here, if you would like. So the first game is one that I actually developed for the University of Tennessee back in 2018, uh, early 2018. This is a project I created to teach high school students how to format APA citations, and I know that there's an update for APA coming out, so we'll have to make some changes to this. Uh, I created this as part of our project grad program. So as part of that, students visit campus for a week. They demo college level courses during the week and stay in dormitories to get an introduction to what it's like to be at college. 
The library is involved by teaching a basic resource, research skills class to those high school students. And we included this as part of our instruction sessions. So it's a more fun way for them to engage with how to create citations. Here's a screenshot for how to locate what you need for a citation from articles. I did pull an excerpt from an actual article and students locate the pieces they need for the citation and drag them to the right side of the screen. On this step, they have gathered the pieces they need and now they need to place them in the correct order to create their citation. And then near the end of the activity, they actually learn how to format the individual parts. So we take it step by step to make it easier on the students. Um, we actually tested this for the first time with project grad students last year, and they seemed to catch on to how to do citations more easily this way instead of us going over them verbally with PowerPoint slides. I think the practice really helps them remember how to format it, and we had far fewer questions about how to cite things at the end of class. Another game that we've used as part of Project Grad is called Goblin Threat, created, created by Lycoming College. Um, it's a game about plagiarism, and it's a really entertaining game where students search for goblins and answer questions to complete activities uh, by identifying plagiarism in order to rid Lycoming College of the goblins. This is one that you can play online, and the link to this is actually included in the notes on the slides as well. Uh, the software that I created to create the last one that came up, the citation activity, was actually created in Adobe Captivate. Here's one of the activities from the Goblin game. Um, so for, for this one, students drag the options that they have to true or false to answer whether these are reasons that it benefits you to cite sources. Another activity has students identify whether this scenario is appropriate and how the students should approach this. The game is really good at giving feedback when students answer incorrectly and providing reasoning for why something like submitting a paper again to another class isn't a good idea. Some other online games that I found when I was looking at library websites are some created by Carnegie Mellon as part of a library arcade. So these games are designed for helping students develop research skills. Uh, they're very good at like, letting students practice some of these skills as well. So the games that they created are called I'll Get It, which helps players identify where to find certain types of material or information, and Within Range, which teaches how to organize and find books according to the Library of Congress classification. Here's a screenshot of I'll Get It. Uh, it's formatted kind of like Diner Dash games, if you've ever played any of those. So patrons come into the library, you talk to them about their research, you take what you know to the library catalog and see what you can find, and then you decide what resource best, best fits their needs. So they've got periodicals over here on the left, books on the right, there's a book return at the bottom. You can pull things up from databases up at the top of the screen as well. And someone in the comments noted that this one is very addictive. When I first found this game, I didn't play for quite a while. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but it's also good practice for students to consider where they can look for resources to answer questions that come up. The game within range, here's a screenshot from it. Uh, this one is also really addicting. So it's great for practicing putting away and locating books according to Library of Congress classification. There's also a handy guide on the left side of the screen as well. Uh, the fun thing about this one is you actually race against the clock to put away the books that are laying on the table to the left. Uh, so you can try to up your score by doing it more quickly. Uh, the books are really easy to pick up and slide around. And I feel like it would be really useful to use when you're training students for how to reshelf books. The next online game I'm going to talk about is called Quarantine from Arizona State University. This is a game about outbreak of a disease, and I actually have two examples that follow this topic. So you run around campus gathering clues and avoiding zombies and investigators in hazmat suits. Um, your character is trying to research a way to cure people. 
So this game is less guided than a lot of the other games that I've shown you so far. It does have a timer, which gives you a sense of urgency when trying to find out the information. Uh, and it encourages students to research carefully and to reach out for librarians for help, even if they're not in an outbreak situation. Uh, the library is kind of centered on the screen here. There are librarian characters that help you find the answers to find the cure, and they also direct you to other locations to find information. Here's a screenshot of what it looks like when you're interacting with one of the characters in this game. Uh, they really did a lot of storytelling with this game as well. They created characters for different office spaces and things happen to them depending on the time uh, that's progressed in the game as well. And here's another game that follows the very same topic. This one is called Bioactive from the University of Florida. Uh, this one's actually formatted in a very different way though. So it's also about a virus outbreak, but this one is in an HTML format and uses image mapping to help students find clues. What I like about this one is it also points to actual library resources as part of the process to complete the game. So here's an example of one of the clues that you gather as part of this game. Uh, for the most part, you just click links to go through pages. There are some image maps that you have to locate something on the image that's up to go on to the next clue. But this one was also pretty fun to play through. Um, it is a little bit older. Uh, it was created in HTML, so there are some differences there. But it just shows that you can approach making games in a lot of different ways. The next collection of games are from the University of Florida, and they were part of a National Science Foundation funded project to create games against plagiarism. Um, they created three games as part of that project called Cheats and Geeks, Frenetic Filing, and Murky Misconduct. Um, the links to all of these games that I'm showing online are also included in the speaker notes in the presentation, so if you download that, you'll be able to go actually play all of these. So the first game is Cheats and Geeks. Um, when I tried to load this one a little bit earlier today, it was having some issues, but I did get it to load before. Um, so this is kind of set up like a boards, board game style game. Players race against a virtual opponent to present the research. Along the way, they're tempted by the opportunity to advance faster by committing research misconduct, including plagiarism, uh, data falsification, and data fabrication. However, they have to watch out for rising suspicion levels and peer reviews in the form of pop quizzes that test their knowledge of research misconduct. The first player to reach the convention wins, but if you get caught violating the ethics code, you get landed in the research ethics office. So it's a game that kind of teaches players uh, things that you can do wrong as part of the research process. Um, in some ways in this game, they can kind of fly under the radar a little bit, but if you do too many wrong things, you get caught. Um, I do think it does a good job of pointing out though, when students choose the wrong option, like letting them know some of the consequences of their actions, what they could potentially be. The second game is Frenetic Filing. This one is also really addictive. Um, so with plagiarism rampant on campus, graduate students are assigned to assist with cases in the research ethics office. Uh, this is a fast-paced arcade game where players review cases of plagiarism, define the type of plagiarism that happened, and then file them accordingly. So you begin in training mode, and then eventually you can advance to arcade mode. This is also very much like Diner Dash. Uh, the files are inserted through the door and show up as these little green boxes or booklets up at the top. Uh, and you try to get as many put into the correct folder before time runs out. You can also in, earn in green upgrades like coffee or sneakers that improve your speed of reviewing and filing cases as well. So this one's pretty fun. The last one from that grouping is called Murky Misconduct. Uh, this is a noir detective style game where you work as a plagiarism investigator in the research ethics office. You evaluate suspect papers, track down evidence across campus comparing passages for specific research misconduct violations. Um, after you play through the story and identify a violation, you have to find the correct amount of evidence to support it, and then you actually talk to the student about what they've done wrong. So here's one of the screenshots from the game uh, where you're actually looking at a source with a tool called an ethics.
the SCAN 3000. Um, so you can actually click through the sources and compare them to other sources you find in the game. You do have an inventory system so you can keep track of the evidence that you locate. And here's an image of the map with all of the different locations you can visit as well. Um, so like the zombie game that I showed earlier with the outbreak, this one is a little bit less guided in that you can visit the locations in the order that you want, uh, but you do have to find evidence from all over the map. Now the last section of games that I'm going to talk about don't fit neatly into the other categories I've talked about, so I've just labeled them under other games. The first is a life-sized version of Clue called Hashtag Adulting from Blunt County Public Library in Tennessee. Now, I actually heard about this one as part of the Tennessee Library Association Conference last year. Uh, so they created this program to, help, program to help teenagers and young adults learn about adulting skills, like how to manage finances or cook healthy food. Uh, they held those workshops, but they also created a large version of the Game of Life, which participants play by walking around the board and throwing the large die pictured. Depending on the space they land on, they either gain funds, which are tracked for each player, or get real-life examples of things you might come across and have to deal with as an adult. They also complete real adult tests, which present scenarios and ask participants how they would respond to them. Um, I've also linked their presentation on the speaker notes on the slides if you'd like to take a look. They speak a little bit more about how they set this up. Um, and then there was also a news story about this game as well. It was very popular for people to come play. Another life-size game uh, was created at the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire. Uh, this one I actually learned about at the Games and Libraries Conference earlier this year. Uh, and some of these images I pulled from their presentation and from their library's newsletter. So every year they have a Library After Dark program they run, which includes a variety of games, including life-size game adaptations. And they really do that as a way to welcome students back to the university uh, and to get them into the library for something fun right at the start of the semester. So they get to know some of the librarians before they even have to start a research project. So here are some images from their life-size clue game. They utilized props and costumes. And they created the board that students walk on out of foam interlocking tiles. So very easy to set up and take down. They also set up mini golf in their library, and I was able to get a few images from that. Um, here you can see some students playing golf between some cabinets in the stacks and in a stairwell. Uh, the really cool thing about this is that they used some of their collections to create some of the obstacles. Uh, also, the octopus cutout that you see at the top of the stairs that has a hole in it for the golf ball to go through was actually created by one of the library staff members. So I think this is a really creative use of their space um, and also an interesting way to get students to explore the library. Um, they've had this as a really successful program. I just think it's really cool for them to set up. Another type of game that's a little bit different than the other ones I've shown so far is a geocache project on the Penn State campus. They have a cache located on campus that leads to a location in the stacks to find an item. Uh, I'm not sure what that item is because they're very secretive about it, but this is a good example of a game that can be played by anyone with no form of schedule or staffing needs. It gets participants to visit different spaces on campus, um, and I'm going to have to visit someday so I can find out what's hiding in their stacks. And at the very end here, I just wanted to share some resources with you for both learning about games that libraries have created, but also how to create games yourself. Um, so the first is Critical Play, Radical Game Design by Mary Flanagan, uh, Resonant Games by Aaron Klopfer, Jason Haas, Scott Osterweil, and Louisa Rosenheck. And then Game On, Gamification, Gameful Design, and The Rise of the Gamer Educator by Kevin Bell are all really good if you're starting to think about how to design games, either for the classroom or for events. Some other resources that might be helpful for you that are maybe a little more focused on producing games commercially, but also that I wanted to include as well, are the Game Designer's Handbook from Nicholas Proctor, um, who actually writes a lot of reacting to the past source books, which are role-playing games that you can use to talk about historical events. 
Um, so this will help you create role-playing games, but it also talks about other game formats as well. Uh, the Game Inventor's Guidebook by Brian Tensman is more about the creating commercial games for selling. Um, it does have some good nuggets of wisdom included in this as well, so I did want to include it on the slide. Um, my favorite book that I've used in game development is Play to Learn by Sharon Bowler and Carl Kapp. Uh, it's got really good worksheets included for how to complete the game design process. It's got information about choosing learning outcomes, thinking about game mechanics and themes. Uh, it's got a lot of good examples that it uses as well. And then it has worksheets for both the development process, but also the testing process. So things you can print out and use uh, while you're having people beta test your game to collect your feedback and see what needs to be changed to make the game work better. Here are a few games that are specifically about games and libraries, and the two on the right are a little bit older, uh, but it's Escape Rooms and Other Immersive Experiences in the Libraries by Alyssa Krosky, Games and Libraries, Essays on Using Play to Connect and Instruct, edited by Brianne Kirsch, and then Gaming and Academic Libraries, edited by Amy Harris and Scott Rice. And I did actually locate some of the games that I presented on by using these books as a resource as well. Um, another resource I wanted to point you to online, which is really helpful if you want to get into designing games, is the University of Northern Texas LibGuide on game design. They actually have collected uh, some articles, books on game design, reference sources, professional development websites you can go to, and then a list of different game design resources you can use. Uh, there's a list of tutorials, there's a community on developing 3D and 2D art for video and computer games. Um, there are also some forums that you can join that are really helpful and game engines and free tools that you can use to play games as well or create them. And then the last website I wanted to point out as a resource is the ALA's Games and Gaming Roundtable, which I'm actually a member of as well. Um, their website has lists of game resources for different types of libraries. Uh, it's got some obstacles and challenges to gaming, as well as some information you could use if you're trying to argue for including games in your library. Uh, this group is looking for members to join as well, so if you're interested, they do have really good discussions on how to set up gaming events for libraries or for people who are interested in developing games. This is also the group that manages International Games Week, which is in November every year as well. And at this time, I will take some questions. I see in the chat here that we're also talking a little bit about Pokemon Go and Harry Potter Wizards Unite. Uh, I've actually played both. I do still play Pokemon Go on campus, which I find is a really great, great way to meet students and faculty from different departments. Um, we do have a stop right outside of our library for a gym um, and multiple stops that are in range of the building as well. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in chat. Um, if your microphones are enabled, you're also welcome to ask that way as well. All right. <clears throat> so this is George. Uh, Allison, I think you got all the questions that were coming in during the presentation. Um, but I will remind you, um, someone had asked about the professional printing, and you said you'd kind of go back to that if there was time. So while everyone else is thinking of their questions, uh, why don't you go ahead and maybe talk a little bit about that for us? Perfect. Yeah, I could do that. Let me pull up here. So there actually are quite a few different sites that you can use for getting board games printed. Um, a lot of them also have pricing. So if you don't need to do a bulk order of board games, like you just need to test out a version, they will create uh, versions for you to just have to test. Um, some of the ones that I've looked into for using to print out the Pendergrass Clue games so far are called the Game Crafter. Uh, there's also the Print and Play website, which does custom board game creating. Um, let's see, there's Board Games Maker. And then if you ever visit uh, the, the website Board Game Geek, there's also a great forum there as well about other companies that you can reach out to about creating components. Um, all of the companies have different options for you in terms of both printing boards, 
cards, but also components that you can add to your games. So some of them have preset pieces that you can just order in different colors or sizes. Uh, but some of them also offer options like customizing dice if you need dice for a game. So there are a lot of different options out there. Uh, a lot of them are US based too, which is really nice. Um, but if you ever need to find out a manufacturer after I get this game printed, I'm happy to let you know how that experience went. I've not actually done that yet, but there are a lot of options out there for creating your game. It looks like we've got a couple of people typing, so... Oh, no, that was just a thanks. Well, thank you, Aaron. <laughs> are there any other questions? Perfect. And I'll wait. I'll wait a few more minutes for other questions. Also, if you have a question that pops up earlier that you didn't get a chance to ask today, uh, you're welcome to reach out to me by email at allison at utk.edu. I'm also on Twitter and occasionally tweet about the game events that we do on campus and the games that I've been working on. So I'm at Allison L. Shepard on there. Okay, a comment from Garrett, not specifically a question, but yeah, board games at yard sales are great for cannibalizing. And then someone added a URL for us, so thanks to everyone in chat. If there are no more questions, I will switch us over to the LEU screen. So up at the top is the LEU file for all of you to download to get your credit. And obviously, Allison just gave us her contact info. My email is at the very bottom of the screen. And I want to thank everyone for coming today. Yes, thank you all for being here. And again, if you have questions later, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to talk about games.